Welcome to another episode of Sisters in Conversation. I'm your host, Debello Motani. I'm an attorney by profession and the founder of a platform called Sister in Law, which is a platform dedicated to empowering women through legal education. On today's episode, I'm with the beautiful Deborah Mutemwa. Thank you so much for joining me, Deborah. Um, well, I was supposed to mention that she's an advocate, but we're <laughs> going to get into that. How are you, Deborah? <laughs> I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. It's been three years in the making, so I'm so glad we're finally doing it. Yeah, you know, I, I, I went back to you and I was like, you didn't say no the last time. You just didn't see my message, but that's fine. It now makes sense. Behind the <laughs> scenes, you explained that you were, um, you know, COVID mommy. Yeah. So that's fine. Yeah. Um, it fell through the cracks, but I'm happy that I got the courage to ask you again. So thank you. Oh, wow. I, I love <laughs> that you think you needed courage. <laughs> I absolutely love what you're doing. So thank you for asking Okay, again. beautiful. Um, at least, you know what, I managed to speak to the one half of <laughs> of your company. So yeah. at least it worked out. Hey, yeah. when I spoke to Tippi so a few years ago, during COVID as well. Indeed. I don't know yes. if you recall yes. that we, we yes, but we did ours virtually because mm, we were still COVID. locked inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Deborah, please, can we get a little bit about you? Please, can you tell us about your upbringing? Mm. Um, you know, what's one of your favorite childhood memories? Mm. Um, where did you go, grow up? How many siblings do you have? Yeah. Where did you go to primary school? Let's just touch a little bit on young Deborah. Wow. So I am a pastor's daughter. Mm. My father and mother moved to South Africa when I was very young. Mm. And we grew up in Johannesburg primarily. I have three siblings, so there are four of us in total. Mm -hmm. I have two older brothers and one younger sister, so I'm the third born. Mm -hmm. I have classic middle child syndrome. Yeah. Both myself and my middle fellow middle child older brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I had a wonderful upbringing. I went to Glen Hazel Primary School, mm -hmm. and then for high school, I went to three high schools. Sure. I went to Sandringham, Eden College, and then matriculated in Windsor House Academy for Girls. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's that's me in a Why very Why did you have to go snapshot. to three different high schools? Were you moving around? Was it... You know, my mom just was very particular about the quality of my education. Mm. So when she felt that, you know, something wasn't necessarily working out well for her, mm. um, or for us, actually, that was the primary reason, then she, she would just find a better space. So I ended up I in a girls' it. school at the end okay. of it all. And how did that go? <laughs> oh, it was fantastic. I made, you know, incredible friends. It was interesting to move into that kind of space. Mm. I was um, a tomboy growing up. So, you know, boys weren't really a bother for me in high school. Okay, okay. Um, I considered myself one of the boys. <laughs> but, <laughs> Especially but, with but it was two better older brothers. than going to a girls' school. Like No, no. Then I enjoyed going to a girls' school because I just, you know, had a yeah. lot of girlfriends. And, yeah, I, I kind of then possibly experienced my femininity for the mm. first time or <laughs> encountered my femininity for the first time at the girls' school. And that was, that was fantastic. Um, my favorite childhood memory, um, there are so many, absolutely so many. I, I grew up in a happy home and I'm really that. grateful for that. My I love that. mom and dad are loving people. Mm -hmm. And I suppose perhaps the best part of growing up as a pastor's daughter was, you know, my father would travel to all kinds of places all around the world, mm -hmm. you know, from mega churches to rural churches. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. he would take us with him. And I'm really grateful that I got that kind of an upbringing because it gave me uh, exposure to a broad spectrum of life. Yeah. You know, in yeah. some in some instances we would, you know, be going to a mega church and we would have a driver and all of that. Mm. Other instances we would go to a rural mm. church where you know people are using pit latrines. We would use pit latrines, and mm. I really got exposed to just the length of breath and breadth of how people lived. Yeah, I I'm really that. grateful for that. And then mm. at home, my parents were just incredibly giving people. Mm. So there was never a point in my upbringing where I can remember my parents not helping somebody. There was okay. always like an older sister, an older brother living with us. Mm. And they just, yeah, they, they helped a lot of people mm. growing up. And I'm grateful for that. And, and and what was your mom's role in the church? Yeah. And maybe as at home as well? Yeah. So my mom was a boss. Mm. <laughs> um, and I'm really grateful for that as well. So she always had a, a career outside of, um, you know, being a pastor's wife. So mm. she was all obviously a pastor's wife. Very engaged, very involved, but she also worked for South African Airways. Okay. So she'd been with the company for 
more than 20 years, starting as a flight attendant, ending as a in-flight service coordinator. Mm. And so she would travel quite a bit. Sure. Um, and she, but, you know, I, I felt her presence, even though maybe mm. one or two weeks out of a month, she wouldn't be there. I, I felt her presence mm. because she was just, you know, on she top of active, it all. Yeah. Yeah, she was incredibly and active present. and she mm. would buy us the best clothes from around the world, from traveling Love and it. all of that wonderful stuff. And um, we also got to travel a lot because uh, in those days, uh, SA would give discounts to I their employees. I remember that. I think, <laughs> and, and I think those family um, discounts were a little bit too generous because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you just get your friend on a flight Absolutely. and say, this is my younger sister or whatever. <laughs> I actually, re I, I do recall a time when those um, benefits were a little bit too... <laughs> Um, relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I did not contribute to <laughs> SAA's woes. Look, we don't. <laughs> we will never know now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was wonderful. So my mom's role was just to be a mother and a boss, mm. and she gave me a, a. She was a great mo role mm. model and mm. really somebody to look up to, and somebody that I still look up to. I love that. Now she's a grandmother. She's actually Yay. in the states for five months helping my brother who just had his first child. Oh, lovely. Um, and she, yeah, she's that kind of person. She's so giving, she's so loving and yeah. I absolutely love that. And then tell us about when the, your first memory of wanting to pursue law or why did you decide to pursue law? Um, mm. You know, was, is, is it a calling or you had seen someone on TV and you're like, I, I want this for myself. Wow. Um, what made me pursue law? I honestly cannot say. I think that I was just led to it. Mm. Um, growing up as a pastor's daughter, I, I was incredibly introverted, um, but I was forced to be an extrovert. I was forced to be able to talk to people and speak in yeah. front of people and debate and all of those wonderful things. Um, and seeing you know, people from all walks of life and being exposed to justice and injustice in a way, mm. you know, through Christianity, um, I suppose kind of just led me down this path, um, this altruistic path. Although I am a corporate lawyer and that's my you know, my background, mm. and um, I, I still have a very human rights heart to me. Mm. And I suppose, you know, my upbringing has a lot to do with that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm. So, so I suppose I was led to it. Uh, I chose it as one of two options at the university I got into law and I absolutely loved it. Mm. And what was yeah. your varsity experience like? Were you one of those, you know, students who are involved in, in, in extra, um, extra mural activities, part of, um, what is it called? SRC. <laughs> or were you just one of those students who like, you know, in the library 12 hours a day, if you're not in class, you're in the library and then go home type thing. So I had a, a classic varsity experience in that I never let the study slip, but I, mm. I certainly had fun with my friends. Mm. So I, um, I suppose, you know, I was academically gifted. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that can be a blessing and a curse. One of my friends said, you know, we would be out with Deborah, you know. We'd oh, all you're the be scammer together. friend. <laughs> And we would write exams and somehow, you know, I'd come out with like 90%. Yeah, yeah the scammer friend. And not the scammer friend. Just, you know, I, I, I was academically gifted, so I enjoyed that. Um, I enjoyed Vosti. I had, I made lifelong connections, mm. lifelong friends um, who are very close even today. And, uh, but I, I also was involved because I was academically gifted, I suppose. Mm. And, you know, it's hard for, for somebody, to, for a woman to say that because it's like seen as bragging. And I love truth. that. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for sharing um, that. <laughs> so, so my, my lecturers would pick, pick on me, like pick me out, call me out quite often. I was asked to represent my university when I was in second year in the All Africa Human Rights Mood Court competition mm. and. I was I was one of those people that would win awards, <laughs> yeah, yeah, at awards evenings. Um, yeah, but yeah, just because I was academically gifted, but I, I would I would also work. Mm. I would I would do the reading. I loved reading growing mm. up. That was my thing. I w could get lost in a book and yeah. So, but okay, so I mean, yes, you'd do the work, but you didn't have to work as hard as the rest of us. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> so you could you you were getting away with just just. 
just being present in the lectures, I think that goes a long way. And then sort of doing your own like pre-reading or post-reading yeah. after the lectures. Yeah, and, I mean, so, and you'd absorb the information. To be fair, I've always had a questionable relationship with sleep. So, you know, when mm. most people would be sleeping, I would I would be studying. I would put in the time. Yeah, yeah. I after would. groove, you'd come back, shower, <laughs> and then start studying. Okay, okay. I don't know. I, I, I can neither confirm nor <laughs> deny that there was groove involved. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I suppose you said fun, eh? Yeah, fun. Yeah, it doesn't mean groove. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I love that. And then... When did you know that you would want to um, become specifically an attorney and that it was time to start looking for articles in, in, yeah. in, in, in your journey through varsity? When, when did it um, occur to you that, okay, this is what I want to do. This is the path I want to take. Mm. This is what I'm interested in. Yeah. I think the big firms, firstly, um, they start recruiting very early. Mm. So for those that are watching and they're studying law you would need to secure articles in your penultimate year mm. if you want to be with one of the big fives um, and around second year the big fives start um, taking on VAC students so vacation work mm. where you go and work at the big firm for two or so weeks that's how it was done back in my day yeah yeah and yeah. I can say back in my day because this was like 2012 2013 uh, yeah so, um, yeah, you'll do two weeks of VAC work, and I was privileged enough to do two weeks of VAC work at two of the really big firms, mm. uh, two of the top five firms. And I was offered a position at the firm I really wanted to end up, mm. and that's, mm. that's how I got into the journey of, uh, or the path of becoming an attorney. Mm. So the firm um, you're referring to is Weber Wenzel? Yes. Is that where you did your articles? Yes. And, and I, yeah. um, how did you then end up you know, focusing on commercial mm. um, litigation or commercial mm. law. So, yeah, now we're talking 2014. That's when I started my articles. Um, Weber's has this, uh, well, m all of the firms rotate. So mm. you would spend a few months in a six to eight months in a particular team and then rotate out as a candidate attorney. And I was privileged enough to start my very first um, rotation in the pro bono litigation department. Okay. That's where, you know, I, I re, um, re engaged with the altruistic reason why I studied law. Mm. And that has remained a part of my career. Um, Marie Haythorn, who was the head of pro bono, is still a great mentor to me. I love that. Um, he's the, if you, if you studied around my time, there was a case study around the battered woman syndrome. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm being a dork now. Yeah, because I'm just like, wait, I um, I was studying to write. <laughs> like back well, then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I but we did graduate around about the same time. I was definitely studying to yeah. write, girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, one of the one of the cases I, I would take note of those details was run by by him and his mm. team, and it was mm. a really incredible case about you know just women's rights to defend themselves in abusive relationships. Mm. And um, I don't want to get into it, but <clears throat> I recall being impacted while studying by that case and I just felt so lucky to work with the attorney mm. behind that um, as my first job. Um, so I was in the pro bono litigation department for eight months then I was in banking and finance mm. and I'm just going to leave it there. Okay. It I really like that, you, that you've that um, you spoken about the pro bono aspects because mm. a lot of people really almost underestimate the role mm. like um, they're attaching it to I don't know, you know, free work, mm. um, you're not being as challenged or challenged as much oh as yeah. the people in banking and finance or the people <laughs> in, you know, um, yeah. I don't know, commercial, the people yeah. who are doing insolvency. Mm. Um, so I really like that you highlighted that it really brought you, brought you back to your um, altruistic self and mm. you enjoyed that role. I think it yes. is important to highlight that the pro bono department does a very important <laughs> job in society. Absolutely. You know, when I was at Weber's, I was also part of something called the Weber Wenzel Leadership Network. Mm. And in my second year of articles, I was the chairwoman of the Corporate Social Investment Committee. Mm -hmm. And the whole point there was to encourage the young professionals within the firm to remember that we have a broader role in society yeah. as legal professionals. 
to give back and to contribute to to making this a better country for everybody. So mm. it's definitely not something to take for granted. Mm. Um, regardless of how deep in corporate I went, I always had a pro bono project. I was always sitting on some board or advising, you know, an it. NGO like Power or mm. Corruption Watch or what have you, because. I, I do genuinely believe that, um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm. And the law is power and an understanding of the law is power. And I think, you know, mm. we should, or as legal professionals, Not take undermine that. that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> you need to tell me why you said banking and finance and you said, mm, I'll park that there. <laughs> <laughs> was there I, it, it wasn't my traumatized? forte. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't my forte. It wasn't my forte. The numbers and the... Uh, the agreements could run to thousands of pages. And at, at that level, as a, uh, a candidate attorney, you're doing something called conditions precedent. So you're making sure that the resolutions are mm. in place and, you know, that the various consents have been f uh, signed and that if there are any third party, you know, implications to a particular transaction, that those mm. are catered for and that, you know, those mm. implications mm. have been, mm. or, you know, considered and if there were any obligations they've been met and so it wasn't exciting for me yeah it is exciting for some people and mm. i think to each his own and i, yeah, I that, it's important that you say that yeah. i like that yeah cause, yeah uh, <laughs> yeah i think you and i are the same in that regard banking and finance nope, <laughs> nope. yeah um, but it was an incredible team and mm. i met some really amazing people and i was really grateful to have worked with the um you know learned from uh, the, the head of the department at the time as well. But um, yeah, that was my second rotation. Mm. My final rotation was in mergers and acquisitions in uh, what was called Corporate 4 at the time. Mm -hmm. And I worked with an incredible team headed up by Johannes Hoes, who at the time that I was leaving Weber's, he also left to go and found DLA Piper. Okay. DLA Piper's office here. Yeah. Um, and that was a, a, an awesome time as well. Met some really great people, worked on some really great transactions. Um, and it really, you know, I was given opportunities that I never would have had had I been working elsewhere. So, sure. yeah. So um, just just the, the, the two years articles experience, what was that like for you? If you can just sum it up into one line. Well, let me give you an example. <laughs> I was living at home whilst doing my articles and my cousin was in the country visiting. And she was there for like three months. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember that. <laughs> she tells me, yeah, we, oh. I, was, I was in your room. <laughs> I shared a room with you. That's how much I worked. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I worked like crazy, but I also yeah. did. I'm, I'm a little bit of an overachiever. So I also did my master's in, in public international law in mm -hmm. my second year of articles mm -hmm. um, as a part-time thing. I had two years to complete it, but I completed it in one year. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was working crazy hours. Mm. But, you know, uh, yeah, I, and, I, and, I used and, my youth, let and, me say. And, you know, <laughs> looking back on the, the, the hard work that you put in back then, mm. was it worth it? Um, Absolutely. And, and and how can you encourage somebody that is not necessarily convinced? You know, I, I feel like lately we have a culture of just doing bare minimum, hey, oh. getting by, um, these terms that are called like quiet quitting, mm. it's the weirdest, craziest thing yeah. ever that I'm, you know, just learning about. And I really feel like um, the current cohort, they're very afraid of working hard, mm. Um of putting in the hours mm. of ensuring that they set themselves apart at a, at an early age or mm. earlier in their career to be, you know, chosen. Yeah. Um, and they really take it for granted that, you know, ensuring that you're seen at the beginning um, mm. can really just set you up for success. What kind of advice do you have for somebody who is listening in and they're just giving bare minimum, like, girl, stop <laughs> it, get up. <laughs> yeah, um... Where to start? I have so many thoughts on that. Firstly, I think one of the most impactful things in my career was having a mentor. Mm. And I had mentors from very early on. My mm. very first mentor was Olga Mushwe. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Olga. She was incredible. She made partner at WebWin, so at 28 years old. Oh. So I had really, mm. you know, somebody, somebody incredible to A look up to. House, yeah. Um, yeah, so I had no excuses, firstly. Secondly, I watched this talk in my early 20s that said, 20 is not the new 30. And it talks about the fact that 
You know, people defer doing the hard things to later on in life because they think there's time. Mm. Mm. There isn't mm. time. Um, and it's not to say, oh, sure. if you haven't achieved certain things by your 20s, yeah. you're a failure. Yeah. No. But I think to those that are in their 20s and they're doing the bare minimum, I would encourage them to watch that talk because, mm. you know, um, life is a gift mm. ultimately, you know, and that's Do you my remember third who the talk is by? It's a TED talk. And if you Google 20 is not the new 30, you'll oh, find it. it. It's, okay. a, it's a blonde lady. I cannot recall her name. Mm. I watched it so long mm. ago, but I still remember I'll it I'll try to look this for day. it and put it in the comment section as well. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, please do. It's, it's an incredible talk. But um, yeah, the final point is that life is a gift. Mm. Not everybody mm. gets to wake up and have the ability to do what they need to do. Mm. Mm. Um, and I read this, this quote that you know said procrastination is the arrogant assumption that God is going to give you another opportunity sure. tomorrow to do what you could have done today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Drag <Greg>, me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying I have the formula right. I'm yeah. not saying I don't procrastinate. But life is a gift. Mm. And um, if I can take it back to you know just who I am as a person, as a Christian, you know the Bible says um, in anything you do. Do it with all your heart, mm. all your mind, as unto the Lord. And I feel like that ties in with the idea that life is a gift. That, yeah. You know, whether you think it's just a random gift, you know, that you're here or, you know, God woke you up in the morning mm. to be able to do something because he has a plan for you, because you're, you, you know, you must become who you are supposed to be sure. because it matters. Yeah. May, maybe not in the grander scheme of things, but maybe just for one other person's life down mm. the line. Um, life is a gift, and if you have something in your hand to do, do it with all of your might. Sure, love that. Yeah. So, I mean, apart from being very busy and forgetting about your poor cousin, um, <laughs> <laughs> staying with you for three months and shacking up in your very bedroom with you, yeah. What is what 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 is one of your best memories of mm. of your articles? And the reason I'm asking that is mm. that a lot of the time, we we highlight how toxic articles were, and we really forget that um, there should have been moments where we should have celebrated mm. our 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 highs. You know, yeah. celebrated whatever we managed to achieve during articles or any any really fond memory of your experience, yeah. whether it was with someone or whether it was um, a personal you know, win mm. on a matter that you were working on or fortunate to work on. Yeah. I mean, I, I have no complaints. I, I do have thoughts about the toxicity of, of articles and how it can be toxic. Mm. It wasn't entirely my experience. On a balance, my experience was very um, pleasant. Mm. But that being said, I'm not the kind of person that doesn't see injustice just because yeah. it's not happening yeah. to me. So yeah. I did see, you know, some of my colleagues not necessarily... Uh, being treated the way they ought to have. Mm. Um, so I don't want to take away from that. But personally, my articles experience was phenomenal. It was fantastic. I love I'm that. so grateful for it. Um, I'm so grateful um, that I got to get the training I got mm. at, at the institution. You know, Weber Wenzel has been around for over 100 years, maybe 160, 70 years. Mm. Um, and the quality of the training is unmatched, unparalleled, Love and it. it set me up for a successful career as as a legal professional. My real highlight was working with Murray Haythorn, okay, who, okay. who is now at the LRC, still doing good work, still fighting it. the good fight, um, and still still a great mentor of mine. the The one case that we um, that that I worked on whilst I was there was the Tides Law Center case. Well, no, Tides Law Center was was the client. It was Amicus in the Zimbabwe torture dockets case, mm -hmm. where um, basically the Constitutional Court had to determine whether, you know, South African law enforcement had jurisdiction to um, investigate crimes against humanity when it happened in a neighboring country, mm. the, the acts happened in a neighboring country, but the evidence was here. Mm. And that was such an important mm. case, you know, I think for sure. for, the, for the continent at the time and for what was happening in Zimbabwe at the mm. time and still is happening, unfortunately. And, um, yeah, at 21 years old, to work on something like that, sure. it was it was life-changing. Yeah, I can imagine. And... Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe just to say, um, 
yeah, it was life changing and it has it has stayed with me and it has defined, I think, and my career and the lens through which I I determine what is important mm, in my career. Mm, mm. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And then, um, you know, just give us a brief um, overview of your time spent as a clerk at the Concord. At the Concord. Yes. Yeah. So um, I was fortunate enough to be... This was after articles, hey? After articles, yes. I, I was retained as an associate, um, but I knew I wanted to go to the court. So okay. I, I did let them know that I would only stay on for six months and then I would go to the constitutional court. Mm. And um, there's a whole process to getting in as a clerk. At yeah, the I can imagine. Court. So <laughs> I, I just, like, just want to know how you knew that I'm only here for six months and then... <laughs> because you you have to apply uh, way ahead of time okay and then you get interviewed way ahead of time mm. as well and i remember um when i when i applied to the constitutional court i you have to uh, submit a written piece mm. and the written piece i submitted was a criticism <laughs> or a critique rather mm. of an aspect of a constitutional court judgment that was handed down by those very judges I was applying, uh, to, applying work to work for <laughs> yes and it was something about it was a point about you know international law and jurisdiction or concurrent or complementarianism uh -huh, uh -huh. in in international criminal law something along those lines I was like oh you didn't quite get this right this is what complementarianism means in this context um, that was my paper. <laughs> and then I got six interviews. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because the now they, judges. Want, they wanted to hear more. <laughs> well, I mean, at 22 years old, I didn't think that was it. I thought, oh, my God, they're going to scold me. But no, it was it was the most pleasant experience. I can imagine. <laughs> wow, it was, it well was the most done. pleasant experience. I got I got uh, to, um, you know, interview with the chief justice and number of the other judges, all of them are obviously legal giants mm. in their own right. But Justice Khan Pepe, How at was the that end experience? of our interview, she said, Deborah, I just want to say to you that as a woman, as a mother, and as a black person, I am proud of you. <laughs> sure. I don't know she would or she would offer me the, the post to be her clerk. I love that you still remember word for word. What an impression <laughs> that created. Absolutely. I mean, we still speak to this day. And indeed, she has been, you know, incredible, an incredible force in my career. But it was wonderful to work at the Constitutional Court because you are working and researching um, on the biggest matters in the country. Literally. <laughs> and sure. the, the records are voluminous mm. and the legal questions are tough mm. and rigorous and, you know, the work is top notch. Mm. And, you know, you get to do this work and then debate it with some of the best mm. legal minds in the country. I would wholeheartedly, you know, recommend that any legal professional, you know, that wants to possibly, you know, wants to practice and possibly end up at the bar um, does a stint at the Constitutional mm. Court. It's it's incredible. Mm. You get to see how judgments are written. You get to be part of that process, you know, the vetting process, sure. the referencing. You know, you go uh, you go into such granular detail into mm. the law, into mm. the facts. It was an incredible springboard for me. Mm. Um, after getting such wonderful training at Weber Wenzel, um, learning to think at that level at uh, at the age that I did, that was also a, an incredible privilege. That sounds so beautiful. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for taking us through that journey. Mm. Um, you've really put it in such a way that, I, like, literally, I was at that interview with you. I could feel <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I could feel um, the warmth and, and, and just, you know, sheesh, all yeah. the knowledge that you um, gained while you were there. Yeah. And then um, I think I, I had another question. I think it was related to your time at Concord. Um, oh yes, is that is that during that time is that when you decided that you actually then wanted to be an advocate? Yes, is that where the seed was planted? <laughs> absolutely, mm. absolutely. I saw some incredible advocates, you know, um, present at that court, and I thought I want to do that one day. Two advocates that left a particular impression on me, and I'm going to name them by name. Yes, they are my seniors now. 
were Emma Weber and um, Francis Hobden. Mm. They spoke at the Constitutional Court mm. as young as they were. You know, they presented. And it's usually a thing that's left for the more senior advocates. Mm, mm. Um, I can't recall the cases, but, you know, they, they stood up and they spoke so eloquently. And as a woman, for me, that was just incredible. Like, yeah. I was yeah. I was just so blown inspired. Blown away, yeah. I was blown away. And I knew that's what I wanted to eventually do. But I going to the bar is quite a commitment. And mm. um, you also need to be ready because mm. ready to start your own practice. Sure. To swim in the ocean, mm. to run your own race. And I felt that I needed a little bit more time in the market as an attorney mm. before I made the jump so I could set myself up for success mm. um, when joining the bar. This isn't to say that, you know, uh, you can't come out of varsity and join the bar and make a success out of your life. There are many, many examples of people who did just that. Um, but for me, I I actually, I got, um, you know, I had a lot of responsibility very early mm. on. So I mm. couldn't necessarily take that gamble. So mm. I needed to have to be sure. a proper savings account mm. <laughs> set up for, mm. for the rigorous year that is Pupilage, Pupilage yeah. I needed to sure. also be sure that yeah. I would be getting the work and I would not be struggling, you know, for mm. two, three years, mm. you know, whilst I set up my practice. And I'm grateful that I did that. And one of the advocates that I mentioned actually advised me that, you know, it, it's it's great, but it's tough. And as a woman, yeah. you, you know, these are the things you need to think about. And I, I took her advice to heart and it, it paid off. I love that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then when in your journey um, are you and Tepiso starting to have discussions of, about starting your own thing? Yeah. And, 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 and what made you guys then just act on that um, mm. instruction from God, if I can put it that way? Definitely was an instruction from God. Mm, <laughs> mm. Um, Tepiso and I are very much similar in our belief systems and our work ethic and everything. Mm. I have such great respect for her. You know, the other day I was telling my sister about somebody who I thought is just so incredibly intelligent. And she was like, wow, they must be so intelligent because you're intelligent. I'm like, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no. But you know what? Uh, as far as rating people, Zepiso Scott is high up there. She's, yeah. she's incredible. Um, and so when I when we were at the Concord together, mm. she was... Um, she was clocking for the acting chamber. And so she, she clocked for two judges, Justice Mba, who was from the uh, Supreme Court of Appeal, mm -hmm. and Judge Mojapelo, who was um, at the time the deputy judge president of the South Gauteng High Court. Mm. <clears throat> and um, so we were sitting one day at uh, in the foyer um, at the Constitutional Court, and Justice Moseneke had just um, ended his term in mm. about... May that that year, and he um, was launching his book, My Own Liberator, mm -mm. and um, you know he quoted a line from his book that said, "We cannot outsource the responsibility to liberate ourselves." Yeah, and me and Sabisa were sitting next to each other, and we said, "Let's start a law firm." <laughs> sure. We said because you didn't her. want to outsource the responsibility to liberate ourselves. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and then everything after that. Yeah, we spoke to the judges. Uh, I, I told my judge she had been an attorney as well, uh, Justice uh, Hampepe. We spoke to Judge Mujapelo, who was an incredible mascot for us in our early mm. formative years. Mm. He would have breakfast with us at least monthly, or you know, there or so mm. as, as schedules allowed there by olives and plates and bits before court. Yes. Um, he introduced us to ja, to advocate Mojanku Gumbi, who mm. was, you know, and still is a legal advisor to President Mbeki. And so, you know, we were really touched by grace in that sense. I that, that when we decided to start it, there were so the many people rallying behind mm. us that, you know, mm we would have had to try hard to mm. fail. <laughs> and I think that answers the questions that, that I've asked so many times in previous episodes of mm. whether in your own journey mm. you've come across men who are intentional about mentoring, you know, mm. especially black women in the mm. profession. Absolutely. Mm. I can I can name so many. Mm. Even to this day I have people, you know, men that are, are mentoring me and I'm so grateful for that. Mm. Um, you know, not everybody's so lucky to meet good men mm, that are mm, invested mm. in and understand 
the challenges that women um, have to face in mm. the legal profession. So definitely Justice Mujabello is way up there. He I was very it. generous with his time, still is to this day, mm. and very grateful for that. He was, yeah. And <laughs> you, you know, you during during our conversation, you've touched a lot on, you know, either mentorship or a mentor. And um, I, I see that that's one of, you know, one of the, main threads in your life or yeah. in your career rather mm. how are you pay, um paying it forward as deborah mm. um just um paying it forward mentorship mentoring other mm. um, women who are coming behind you or young, young legal practitioners what are you doing yeah uh you know giving back is a huge part of who i am um from a christian christian ethos perspective but also just from a, a from a gratitude perspective, mm. I think giving back is an act of gratitude. So definitely, I have mentees, and um, you know, I've always had a mentee or two since I started. Um, we started the law firm. Mm. Time didn't allow when I had my kids, yeah, <laughs> yeah so that phased out. But mm. yeah, now I'm at the bar, and I'm fresh. <laughs> yeah, I'm a first year. Yeah, I'm a baby junior. But I'm grateful that some some of my peers, we're colleagues, we're the same year, and I, I don't take that for granted, you know. But, you know, they, they see me as a mentor, mm. and I, I take time mm. to, you know, work with them, work with them through their documents and, you know, the like. Mm. Um, so d paying it forward is, I think, a, an act of gratitude. So mm. definitely a thing that's important. Mm. Thank you for mentioning that your peers, you are, you know, same level of you know first year mm. uh doing doing your being an advocate for the first year sorry yeah. but they see you as a mentor that's important because a lot of the time we think that the mentor mentee relationship needs to be somebody who's you know older than you and we see it from an age perspective yeah and not necessarily understanding that even though we are peers mm. the same age even the same age actually mm. i may have more experience mm. in a particular field or particular area of mm. practice which you are trying to actually come into yeah um so yeah. that relationship can exist even if we went to the same varsity um mm. same age and had similar roles yeah those roles could have been you in human rights specifically yeah. and me in family law and now i'm trying to move to human rights yes. right yeah yeah so i love that you mentioned that yeah Sure. It is important, but let me not lie to you. I am st a little bit older. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Just because okay. I, I started my career very early. Like, yes, yes. I think this year will be 10 years since I started working yeah. as a legal professional. Yeah. 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 We've but, but still. We've been at it for a while. Yeah, we have yeah, been we, at it for a, a while. We're a bit old now. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell me about your uh, naturally, you know, starting a company or, 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 or being the boss mm. is... Is it difficult? It's, it's, it's a bit difficult. It's a bit challenging. But can you tell me what are what are your highlights mm. um, as uh, Tumbo Scott? Like, what's mm. what's that one matter where you and Sepiso were like, yeah, we are the girls we <laughs> think we are. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there were so many, so many wins, and we we made sure to to take stock. Yeah, I think for me the biggest win is I've stepped back from the business altogether, mm. and Sepiso is pursuing a. a, a an academic career, mm -hmm. but Tumbo Scott still stands strong. Yeah, you see. To so build a resilient yeah. business that, yeah. you know, there's a new managing director and clients are still coming and, you know, this... It's so the identity or the brand hasn't yeah. changed, right? Yes. And that's your work. Absolutely. I think building something that isn't centered around you, building mm. something that is beyond yourself mm. is really important. That's a huge highlight for me. Um, we started Tumbo Scott when I was 26 years old. Dr. Scott was 27. Mm. We were babies, mm. <laughs> mm. to say the least. Um, we Look, had giants. Man, I feel like I'm still a baby, like, <laughs> even in my 30s. I'm just... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Adulting is yeah. another story altogether. I'm just a baby. <laughs> <laughs> that conversation sure. needs, so needs 26, a whole... 26, 27. Mm. Yeah, 26, mm. 27. And, um, yeah, we were standing on the... Shoulders of giants. Let yeah. me not lie yeah. there. Um, and and just one point I wanted to make on that is that, you know, they say if you want to go fast, go 
alone but if you want to go far go together mm. so never feel too proud to ask for help mm. never feel too proud to approach somebody and ask them to mentor you mm. never ne- pride is what holds a lot of people back mm. always you know put yourself out there um the 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 highlights for me were when i think i was 27 the year, the year after we founded it i was um you know listed in the mail and guardian 200 yes, young south africans I I think and that's when I started following your journey. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was some years ago now. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and um, that was, I didn't even know that that was a thing. Yeah. But it was so encouraging. I, was, I love it. You know, um, the presenter, I can't recall, uh, it was Anele. Um, she said, you know, this is just, you know, on the road to success. This is just a pit stop to let you guys know that you're going in the right direction mm. and keep going. Mm. And so for me, that was really important because I took a 75% pay cut to start the business. Mm. And, you know, you struggle. You, you're you the CEO. You're mm. also the chief dishwasher. Yeah, you're um, the every, chief see, maintenance you're doing official. Everything, <laughs> doing everything. Doing absolutely everything. Debt um, collector. Yo. Debt collector. <laughs> <laughs> Entrepreneurship yeah. can be rough in the first few days. <laughs> yeah. In the, yeah. But, um, yeah, to, to be told to keep going. And then things just like... Fall got better place. from there you know yeah. i got a I, I was i received an award from the premier uh, uh, Hateng premier Sh- premier's award for youth excellence in justice and it. law i um and these awards don't you know it's it, it, it isn't like they're not the basis of my identity mm. but it's encouragement mm. it's but so I, encouraging. and i think they're the confidence boost that we need and absolutely. there's absolutely nothing wrong with that absolutely um, like every time you get an award, you it gives you the confidence that you didn't know you needed, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, because you think, oh, <laughs> you I got looking this. For it. Yes, yeah. and you're just like, okay, I didn't know I needed this, yeah. and you get it, and you feel good, and you keep going. So yeah. I love that. You know, you're just working. You got your head down. You're working. You look up, and people are like, oh, we see you, mm. and that is that is really special. I had a full circle moment like that this week, actually. A lecturer, mm. a senior lecturer, e- emailed me from out of the blue saying. You know, hi, Advocate um, Mutemwa. I got a hold of some heads you worked on in a case, and this case is now a case study for sure. an assignment for my university students. And I, I, I didn't this. even know that that was a thing yes. that could happen, um, especially two months into practice. But it was like a thing that I didn't know I needed. But yeah. anyway, the highlights the highlights uh, at Tumbo Scott were, were those. We, we, we bagged very early on, 2018, a big client, a big mm. corporate client, one mm. of the biggest banks. They, they and they have been a client since. Even now, um, you know, the new managing director is is managing that client relationship. That was a moment for us because mm. you know when nobody people aren't readily willing to give two young black girls a chance uh, in and, law. And I wanted to actually <laughs> highlight young. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And or, already there's just we we yeah. know the nuances. Young. Yeah. yeah. Black. Yeah. Female. So. <laughs> That's incredible. It took a lot of courage that to do what incredible. we did and and to be validated in that way. That mm. was amazing. We also did a big project for the African Union. Mm. Um, and that was incredible and incredibly rewarding, but both financially and also in terms of the outcome. Great, great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, then, um, yeah, then in, in 2020, I think, I was pregnant with my firstborn. 2021, I was pregnant with my second born. Mm. Uh, well, my, my first born, I, I got pregnant in 2019. She was mm. born in 2020. And somewhere between there and, you know, in those years when I thought, oh, you know, I'm just hanging on by a thread. I'm running this business. It's COVID. You know, things aren't, you things know. Things aren't stable. We're just certain. To, yeah, yes. So many clients yes. like pulled out, but we got so many other clients. Mm. We pivoted into the direction of litigation. Mm. And that is actually the year. I got featured in Forbes, 30 under 30. Sure. That is the year that we uh, quadrupled our annual income, mm. our revenue. Mm. And um, that was special for me mm. because in a moment where you feel like you should I be failing, thread. maybe mm. we should close shop and, you know, um, number one, not only do you get clients and, you know, the business survives, but it thrives. But it three times better than any other year. Yeah, and now I'm part of the, this global community of high achievers. The Yo. Forbes community is just breathtaking. Yeah. Just breathtaking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. 
incredible, Debra. <laughs> oh, it's been such a pleasure chatting to you. Thank you so much Thank you. for coming to tell your story. Thank you. Now, in the last five minutes or these last five minutes that we have together, mm -hmm. is there a question I haven't asked you um, <laughs> which you'd like to touch on? Anything, anything of interest, any words of motivation for for young practitioners or students who are listening to this episode, mm. any words of encouragement that you'd like to say, any gems, mm. um, just really anything that you'd like to share on this platform that yeah. you think will really change someone's life or even a moment for you to take stock of your own journey now that you've um, had an opportunity to reflect because I believe that's what this conversation allows you to do, you know, mm. um, just take stock, mm. reflect, um, yeah. and, and, and these are your five minutes. Yeah, um, firstly, thank you so much. I'm so grateful, you know. I never would have dreamed that somebody would want to talk to me about my journey. Oh, wow. <laughs> Little old me. Look, you have you Forbes know? talking to you about your journey, please. <laughs> yeah, but even that, you know, I, I didn't uh, expect things to go so well. I just worked hard and mm. believed. And, um, you know, I think that's the one thing to to young, aspiring legal female legal pr pr practitioners. Mm. Work hard and believe. There was one question that you had sent me that I did want to touch on. You know, what was the most difficult uh, encounter or moment in your career? Mm, mm. Thank you, I because I wanted to ask that. And, and I just thought, oh, my goodness, I've actually really just been highlighting or rather asking you to share the highlights of yeah. your career. But yeah. I think the lowlights are very important for us to touch on just mm. um, just so that people know that sometimes you do fall upon mm. hard times where you are, yeah. you know, second guessing doubting or yeah. just like oh, what on earth is going on yeah yeah so please do share that with us i'd yeah. love that i'm not going to do justice to to your intro into my moment <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but but I, 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 there isn't a particular moment mm. i would mm. say that there have been a few moments in my career where you know i had to stand on my integrity sure and i think as legal hey, practitioners important. you will be faced with situations where your integrity is on the line. Can I tell you, I wanted to tie that with your um, your intro where you said your dad is a pastor. Yeah. And I wanted to tie, like, you know the law and yeah. um, when it when, when, when it um, comes, you yeah. know, when yeah. we're comparing it with Christianity <laughs> and those beliefs. Okay, so thank you for Absolutely. touching on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I think, you know, my favorite verse, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Psalms where David writes, let integrity and uprightness preserve me mm. you know this career is long if you love the law you're going to be in it for a long time yeah and what is going to set you apart in the long run and i've only been in here 10 years is your integrity mm. you know and there'll be times where you can you know play people against each other mm. there'll be times where you have opportunities mm. that you can um you know exploit sure. for the bet to to come out more on top mm. there are times where you have failed to deliver and you have to have a tough conversation and not make excuses you know there will be times when even you know even times where you know it's it's a, a, a conversation of integrity with yourself sure. where you accord yourself a certain sense of dignity you know and um the environment you're in does not is 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 not in is is incongruent mm. with that dignity you have within yourself mm. there's that personal integrity to say even if I must go hungry for the next few months, mm. I'm going to leave this space. Mm. I'm going to work hard to get into a better space. So I think there, there are going to be very, very many moments where your integrity will be called in, uh, you know, your integrity will be on the line. And I must say that you must never cross that line. Sure. Because it there's is no turning back. Hey? Yeah. yeah. It is integrity and uprightness that will preserve you. And it will open doors for you when you are when you're proven to be a person of integrity. Mm. It will open doors for you. I was in gave me invited. <laughs> I love that. I was invited to sit on my first board when I was 28 years old on a listed entity, and I think it's because the person who put my name up knew me. Mm. They knew that you know when push comes to shove, Deborah will do the right thing. Mm. She will speak to truth to power, and um, yeah. So integrity and uprightness let it preserve you. Second thing, words of wisdom. You know, um, there's somebody who says it. I actually know exactly who says it, but I'm mm. not a fan of him. <laughs> <laughs> it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and I, I think he was giving one of these commencement speeches at one of these um, universities. And he said, you know, you have to dig deep down, dig really deep down 
and decide who you want to be. Sure. Not what, mm. but who. Mm. Who you are comes before what you do. Mm. And I think that working on yourself as a person, regardless of you know how the world perceives you, perceptions shift and change and gossip comes and goes, but who you are mm. at the core of your being will define your life. So you have to decide early on, especially to young girls in the legal profession. Sure. It's a high-powered space. You yeah. come across high-powered individuals. You come across successful men. You come across people that, you know, want to take advantage of you. You need to decide who you are and what you stand for mm. and what you will not stand for and stand on that. So, yeah, dig deep down and decide who you want to be before no, what. That, that has to be drops mic. There's nothing <laughs> further. I can ask you because <laughs> you have just put that so beautifully. And just once again, Deborah, thank you so much for sharing those gems with us in the last five minutes. You did not come to play with those five <laughs> minutes. You were like, okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for just really painting that so beautifully. And I really thank hope, you. Um, you know, your words and pearls of wisdom have landed on the right ear. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. And I can't wait to see you under the what Forbes 40 under 40s list <laughs> under 50s as well you're so I think, kind I think there's an over 30s under 50 now hey yeah um and 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 they've done away with the under 40s mm. so I I know where I'll see you next <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and thank you for having me I'm I'm very inspired by what you're doing thank you I'm very inspired by your passion thank you and keep going honestly keep going thank you thank so much you. Deborah you at home I know you enjoyed today's episode if you absolutely enjoyed today's episode please don't forget to like don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to share this episode with your loved ones until next time bye